Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chaya Chats. My name is Ruben Thomas, and I'm very happy to have with us today Reverend Father Teji Abraham. Teji Etchen, thanks for joining us today. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here, Achin. Uh, for those of you who don't know Achin, uh, he's currently serving as the assistant vicar of the St. Gregorio's Orthodox Church in Elmhurst, Chicago. And he's also the director of the Department of Counseling for our Southwest Diocese. Um, so very happy to have you here, Achin. And part of your background is the reason why we went with this topic today, which is confession versus counseling. I think just to start off on the first part of that, Ajahn, can you go into what is the sacrament of confession and how do we engage in that, especially in terms of our spiritual father? Sure. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you to discuss. I think that's a pretty important topic for us to discuss. And I think you actually hit the nail on the head when you said the sacrament of confession. It is a sacrament. It's, it's you know, we typically like to say that there's maybe seven major sacraments and, 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 and all that. And so confession is, is, is one of those sacraments. It's a healing sacrament. And the, the main concern regarding confession is this idea of repentance, is that we are taking a very strict and a very real examination of our lives. And we look at what we've done, what how we've either fallen, either because of our actions or our thoughts or our words, fallen from that image or fallen from that ideal model that Christ has set for us, and really take a very serious examination of our of our life. We have to face our downfalls, face our our our, our mistakes, and also at the same time find a way of making those things right again, putting things right. And so we do that with the aid of the of the spiritual father or the father confessor to give us guidance because none of us does anything by ourselves we have someone to kind of help us and guide us and they also hold us accountable um, having a spiritual father is, is one of those things that helps us to also be accountable for the things that we confess um, and also make sure that we're kind of maintaining the goals that we've set in in each confession uh, moving forward and even in our last episode, uh, when we talked about the spiritual father relationship, I think we mentioned about how big a part confession is in that relationship. Um, but to go a little bit deeper into that, you know, we get a lot of questions sometimes of what do I even bring to my spiritual father or how often should I go just for confession? And what do you think are the best practices that we can follow? Sure. I know that I think typically I'd say in our in our church, it seems like we have this, I don't know if I want to call it a tradition, but we have a practice of maybe only confessing once a year because we feel like, oh, once a year is all we need. And maybe it's because it's outlined in the uh, in the church constitution that all members of the church need to count the good to go to confession and receive communion once a year. But we have to understand that that idea of once a year confession is actually a minimum, not a maximum. I think a lot of us maybe treat it as a maximum, if even that much at all. So as far as the frequency of confession, there's many guidelines or, or, or many different spiritual church fathers have given different guidelines on that. And even different jur church jur jurisdictions might have different guidances on that. Like I know that there's some in some of the Eastern traditions, some of the jurisdictions will say that they have to confess before every time they want to receive Holy Kurbana. A lot of the Syrian fathers that I've read typically say that really, you know, a regular confession can can happen just by basically once every 40 days. And that seems like a lot. That, that frequency seems like a lot. And so in general, with the with the folks who come and confess to me regularly, they typically end up con coming to me around every, just every, you know, two to three months, whenever they feel like they want to discuss something or they have something that's weighing on them that they want to talk about they want some kind of closure on or they they they, they really you know let's this weighing on their hearts at the end of the day we have things that are weighing on our heart we have guilt we have things that we need to work through um and so whenever you feel like you have something you want to work through you know go to confession uh what i would say is that there's no if we say once a year is a bare minimum then I, there's not necessarily a bare like a maximum but I wouldn't say, you know, going every day or going every week, that might be a little too much, but finding a good balance, like, you know, every 40 days, like I said, in the some Syrian traditions or a couple of months here and there, at least a few times a year, we should be able to go and have that, that experience of confessing uh, before our priest. To go into a little bit about maybe some of the obstacles to confession in terms of someone who wants to go. I know a lot of times, especially when we're younger, we might feel that embarrassment or guilt 
and having to say it out loud. You know, when we're even trying to build up that spiritual father relationship, it almost feels like Achin might, you know, judge me or say certain things. And that's why we don't want to talk to him. And also when we're when we know we have to go to confession, like it's good for our souls, uh, we might find ourselves stuck on where do you even where do we even start that sort of self-reflection can be a tough process itself um, so what do you think are some ways to handle those struggles i totally understand that going to confession can seem a little scary especially to someone who's never been before or to someone who doesn't go very frequently. And we often might think that the priest might judge us, especially if it's someone that we know, oh, he looked at me, he, he knew me and he liked me this way, but what if I say something that's gonna shock him? Or what if I say something that he's gonna no longer like me anymore and he's not gonna look at me the same way anymore? And my honest to God counsel on that would be, none of that is true. What we as priests want from our people is to come to confession. As we kind of mentioned earlier, the confession is, is a healing sacrament. And so with that in mind, we know that sin is like a disease and it has side effects. It, it affects us. It affects us. Sometimes it can even affect, uh, affect us physiologically. Um, it definitely is going to affect us emotionally and spiritually. And so to gain that healing, the medicine for that really is uh, repentance through confession. And it seems like it's daunting at times and you might feel ashamed and guilty. And all those things are a normal uh, normal thing to feel. It's normal to feel ashamed um, because we should. We, we, we did something that we probably shouldn't have done or we said something or we sinned through inaction sometimes or like, you know, we're, you know what the right thing was to do and we decide we, for some reason, didn't do that. So all of these things build up in us, uh, guilt and shame and despair, and all those things are normal. And what Satan wants to do is to kind of keep us there. Because the longer that we stay in despair, the more we're going to say things like, oh, well, what's the point? I, I, you know, I'm not a good person, or maybe I'm going to keep doing this again, and, and, and all that. Because he wants us to continue to, to get, put distance between ourselves and God. But with confession it is the beginning of healing. And it, the reason that we feel maybe guilt and shame, and especially coming in and, and saying these things out loud to somebody, um, especially an action, you know, it, it, it takes real humility to confess. It takes humility to repent. The, there's an adage that says that pride is a mother of sin. Pride is what causes, is that, that thing that initiates that, that a little seed of sin. Well, if the opposite of sin is repentance and the opposite of pride is humility, so if pride is a mother of sin, then humility is that first step towards repentance. And so it takes humility to be able to confront our sins and to look at ourselves very soberly and very and very you know practically and realistically and say, look, these are the things that I've done that I shouldn't have, and I need to 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 make amends. I need to atone for that. I need to repent for that. And so it is. It's not um, something that I would say is is easy, but at the same time. If you imagine any other kind of illness or ailment that we face and we want to go and seek treatment, sometimes the treatment might might seem a little scary for a young child. Maybe a vaccination or a treatment might seem painful at first even. But that small amount of pain that we experience in the beginning is nothing compared to the healing that you receive afterwards. And so when it comes to confession, yes, we might be nervous, we might be ashamed, we might have these feelings of guilt, but the purpose of going to confession is to actually specifically deal with those feelings. And then you're able to actually overcome our guilt, is to absolve us from those feelings of shame and guilt and despair so that on the other side of it, we actually feel better and we start healing emotionally and spiritually from these scars of sin. And I think that when we're talking about confession, I think it's important for everyone to realize that out of all the sacraments, it's probably the most underused and underrated sacrament that we have in our church in terms of how maybe we've been brought up to view it um, and even as it's used more in our church as sort of a rule and standard for people to be able to take part in certain things um, and they have to meet the bare minimum and even for myself included it's almost seems like it's like not the first thing in your mind when we've done something wrong <laughs> is to say we need to confess I just want to say, like, it, it can be pretty tough, especially when we don't have that practice instilled in us from a young age to really get into that habit. Yeah, it's definitely hard if we don't start practicing at a young age. 
And even just speaking from our experience here, the parish that I serve in, we actually start encouraging some of our young kids to start confessing pretty early on. And I'd even say that might be real. You might even argue that maybe it's too early, but they're not, you know, they're, they're not here to sometimes they have most of the most kids uh, from a young age, even as young as say, you know, six, seven, eight, know the difference between right and wrong. And so what we do is, you know, we just start talking to them very basically about what is right, what is wrong. And then have they, is there anything that they felt like that they may have done that they're not proud of? Is there anything that they have done that they knew that they probably shouldn't have done? And so when you start having these conversations with kids at a young age, it becomes much more normalized. And the reason that I think it's one of those things that we are so reluctant to do is because it's just we don't feel like it's a normal part of our of our spiritual life. Many of us probably take like vitamin supplements just as a part of our physical health. You know, things like confession are there for our spiritual health. And when we do these practices normally, it takes away first of all the fear because you have more practice doing it. And then the second thing is you actually have it. It, it leads to a greater amount of spiritual health. And, and you know, you don't hold on to guilt for a long time. One of the negative side effects of not having confession frequently or regularly is that oftentimes we hold on to guilt and many of our young people hold on to it for years. I even had a confession with uh, an adult who had been holding on to something for many, many years, uh, at least a decade or more. And they were just, just the amount of guilt and the, and how much of a toll it was taking on them was, was very sad to see. And so having a relationship with a spiritual father, a father confessor, um, being able to, and, and to seek that, that treatment, that spiritual treatment regularly will help. But it's, it is one of those things that, like you said, is, is very, it's often very underutilized. I'd say confession and probably unction are probably the two most underutilized sacraments we have in our church, and oftentimes for the same reason, because there's, a, there's an element of fear in both of them. Absolutely. And I think going into the second part of our topic a little bit here, which was counseling, is there an element of counseling within confession itself? How does that relate to, you know, actual counseling, like secular uh, counseling or therapy? And in terms of, you know, when we talked about the spiritual father relationship in our last episode specifically, we did say that, you know, there is that guidance and counseling present during that relationship. So specifically in within confession and then outside of confession, what role does counseling play? Absolutely. There is an element of counseling in confession. And they're, they're, they're both very much related because both deal with an element of healing. Both in, involve healing. But confession specifically relates to repentance and trying to make atonement and make amends for our sins. Whereas counseling is very specific to the type of healing that can come from either emotional distress or mental illness or any number of non-physical, non-physiological ailments that, that, that actually many of us suffer from. And they can be, and counseling, you know, has a huge range of topics and of, and of things that it deals with. And it can be from something common, like say maybe like anxiety, fear, certain phobias. And it continues on based on how people are affected by it to, you know, certain mental illnesses, certain uh, behavioral mental uh, disorders and things like that. And so it, it encompasses a, a wide range of things, just like even in our physical health, we have, you know, minor aches and pains all the way to serious injuries and serious illnesses. And so there's a wide range of things, especially when it comes to mental health. But both confession and counseling have an element of healing. And oftentimes, especially for those, the, you know, those individuals who maybe don't go to confession for long periods of time, oftentimes they, they need both. Oftentimes, if anything, I'd say we all, all of, at some point in our lives need counseling. Um, confession is a sacrament that we all deal with uh, as sinners because we all acknowledge that we're all sinners and that we all that we live in a fallen world and we ourselves are fallen. And so confession is our opportunity to uh, get back our grace that we had lost because of our sinfulness. But counseling is going a little further in the sense that it's actually treating that emotional injury that many of us have just living our day-to-day -day lives. That's not necessarily associated with sinfulness and repentance, but 
another aspect of healing, specifically on 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 those emotional scars that all of us have that are beneath the surface. And so, in that sense, we're all sinners who suffer from the affliction of sin. Therefore, we all need confession. But at the same time, we're all broken. We all have something that causes us some sort of emotional distress at some point in our lives, and we need counseling for that. And so, I think that it's both are essential for our well-being. Uh, and both, I think, are actually necessary that we need, that all of us will need at some point in our life. Confession, definitely, regularly, as part of our spiritual health and our spiritual growth. But counseling is just just like you go for regular regular well well being checkups at, at a physician. Counseling and, and and things like on that on that side are also necessary to kind of maintain that emotional health as well. And I think when you when you brought up the practice of at our MGOC some retreats and conferences uh, being the times of confession in our lives. And I think we also see the trend of we have a confession sign up list and a counseling sign up list, right? And um, and anyone can choose what they want. Sometimes they turn into a mixture of the two when you're talking to, a, to an Uchin about it. Um, and that could be due to the frequency of when we actually engage in those practices with our spiritual father. But that is something that I think we we talk about a lot in is counseling with a spiritual father. But when we say that we need counseling or therapy, how do we know when we need to seek help outside of our spiritual father? And is it necessary at times for us to have another person, another counselor there, someone who's trained to help us? Yeah, you know, and I do say that there is always, I think we, as, as I said earlier, there is always um, an element of counseling within confession. But even going you know, more to the point, your spiritual father is going to give you counseling. And, 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 you know, even if you like, kind of like, let's parse the word counseling a little bit. Counsel you know, is, 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 is advice. It's someone who gives you advice in your life and someone who guides you in your life. And so a father confessor is, is the role of the father confessor, spiritual father in that sense. Especially if it's a, you know, since we're talking about in, in the line of priests, when it comes to um, specifically with the role of the priest in confession, the priest is act, you know, is, is administering a sacrament. There is a, an, an intercession by the priest on behalf of the penitent, seeking a renewal of the grace that they received. At the end of the confession, at the end of the confession, the priest, uh, you know, absolves you. And as Christ said in Gospel of Saint Matthew, uh, chapter sixteen. He says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. He gave that authority to the apostles. And so if you ever have heard the prayer, sometimes sometimes, sometimes the Achans will say the prayer of absolution silently, or maybe your Achan might say it in Malayalam. Um, but if he says it in English, you might hear it. It says, by the authority of the priesthood, which was given by Christ to the disciples, and the disciples to their successors, who were the bishops, until it was given to me. I, who am weak and sinful, absolve you, Dear brothers and sisters of all the sins you have confessed and are repentant of. And so to say that shows us that the authority, that there's a sacramental authority here, that there's something that's happening on a, on a, very, on a sacramental, on a mystical level where the priest absolves the penitent um, and really returns him. And we say that, you know, when you go to confession, you are basically returned to the immediate post baptismal state. You're, you know, you're pure, you are spotless. Uh, the stains of sin have been. Uh, washed off of you, and you were in the same spiritual state as you were at the time of your uh, following your baptism. Um, so, and that's why it's purification. It's to remove those stains of sin from us, and to to absolve us of of the guilt, and to absolve us of our uncleanness when it comes to uh, um, sinfulness. And so, that's the specific role of the priest. And when you were talking about, you know, at the conferences, sometimes you have the the counseling sign up and the confession sign up. Well, the confession sign up is only going to be with the priests. The counseling sign up could be with the priest, but it could also be maybe there's a deacon there, or there may, maybe there's um, sometimes seminarians are there, um, and sometimes you know just the, we, sometimes we even have uh, seminarians, whether male or female. Those some of the, you know seminarians have received some sort of pastoral training as part of their education in seminary, and even now we have many professional counselors who have training and education in counseling and social work or those kind of related fields um, and so they can offer they, they can offer counseling and so sometimes you know, you wonder when do you need one versus the other you know confession strictly speaking is about repentance and it's about confronting our sins and seeking 
absolution for our sins from the priest. Counseling, on the other hand, can happen from a priest, but it can it can also happen from a therapist or a counselor, anything like that. You know, that, that's what his counsel is, is that guidance um, that we receive. And so sometimes, you know, sin does cause us to have emotional scars. Sin does cause us to have those invisible injuries that no one else can see something, but that, that's deep, deeply rooted within us. And so there, and which is why I said when a priest gives you counsel during confession, yeah, there's some element of that emotional healing there as well. But the primary concern of confession is, is about repentance and even penance at the end of the confession. Sometimes you're, the father confessor might give a penance, a rule of penance or something, some action to make things right, some action that the person has to perform to, to finally complete the confession so that they can then be absolved, so that they can, so that things can be put back right that went wrong. With counseling, this idea of sinfulness and penance is not necessarily the primary focus, just like how a doctor would try to look to see what's causing illness or what's causing, what are the underlying symptoms, what what is causing this injury, what is causing this illness in the, in the person. Counseling is doing the same thing. And oftentimes you might even be looking at counseling is one of those things that we talk about is very long term. So, you know, sometimes you might think about maybe childhood experiences or traumas or things like that that people are dealing with. And you want to work through those emotions and work through those feelings to gain some kind of emotional healing. And sometimes counseling can be on that level, but it can also just be someone that needs just guidance in their life. And they're looking for, I'm facing some certain tough decisions in my life. I don't know how to proceed, or I'm having trouble with this relationship in my life or with that relationship in my life. I'm trying to figure out how best to talk to them, how best to uh, work out some of these issues, that's when counseling really becomes part of it, where you're trying to gain that kind of healing, you're trying to gain that kind of guidance, um, where necessarily repentance and sinfulness is not necessarily the main focus of the interaction. And counseling then on that hand, not necessarily needed to have a priest, but confession, you have to have a priest because it's administered, it's a, it's a sacrament that's administered. Um, but for counseling, we, you know, like I said, there's, there's sometimes you can have a deacon or a seminarian or even, like I said, someone who, who's already trained in that, in that world to, to be able to offer that kind of guidance. And they have, the, they have the tools to be able to offer that kind of guidance. And many of our priests, when they go through the seminary process, the training in seminary does give us some training in, in those kind of pastoral counseling concerns. But not all of us have a counseling background. Many actions do. Many actions do have a counseling background so they can actually go deeper. Sometimes when you're, when you need to know whether or not you need to, you need to see counseling or need additional help, it's when, you know, the person that you're speaking to and hopefully the person that you're speaking to is humble enough to know that, you know what, this is beyond the tools that I have to be able to address. And so maybe I might Say, if, if someone comes to me with a certain uh, set of issues or a certain set of things that they're dealing with, I might say, I don't think I have the tools to deal with this, but let me see if, if we can find a counselor or a therapist or something who can actually help you work through this, because not all of us have those tools. And some Uchins do, but a lot of Uchins don't. Uh, me being one of them, I don't have a counseling background, but I do come from an educational background. I taught for several years in high schools. Um, and so because of just that and because of my seminary training, I have a little bit of a, a bit of guidance on, on, on certain of uh, some of those emotional issues and things that our young people especially face. And so I'm able to I know what my limits are. And if I feel like someone is coming to me with something that I can't deal with, I will try to direct them towards someone who might have those skills and that set of training to be able to help them get that healing that they need. Just like, for example, if someone came to me with a very serious illness, I'm not a physician. I'm not going to tell them what they need to do to get treatment for that. So just like if someone comes to me with, with the same emotional ailments or things like that, those emotional wounds, and I, and I realize that it's not something that I can handle, I will be very honest and say, hey, maybe this is something that you need to seek actual counseling and maybe a therapist. And that's not a bad thing. Because we're talking about, again, it's tough, we're talking about healing. I think there's there's a bit of a stigma, a bit of a fear in our society, in society in general, where I feel like in, in the wider society, it's becoming more and more acceptable. Um, it's becoming more and more normalized. But maybe in our Indian society, in Malayali society, it's not as much. But I just want to say, that's not a bad thing to, to want to, to seek counseling. It's a good thing. Um, just like, you know, if you're if you have an ailment, if you have an illness, you go see a doctor. If it's a physical ailment. The same thing is true for anything that's happening on an emotional level. You should go see someone, absolutely.
And that's an interesting point that you brought up because that was going to be my next question, actually, is that when we talked about how uncomfortable it might be to go to confession with a spiritual father and overcoming that. And then even now when we're talking about actually seeking counseling and therapy, right, and especially in our community for us when we deal with these issues, you're right, there is a stigma attached to even saying those words and definitely I've heard from other people that when they go to their parents or their family about saying I want to see a therapist you know there's you know there's a disconnect there and then you know there's sort of a no you know why do you need to do that right uh, you know Uchin is fine you know talk to Uchin and all, everything will be fine but you know if you go to see a therapist and this is just um, too bad or it's too uh, bad to fix and you know it's just something we don't want you to do um, can you go into a little bit more about why we even have that in the first place, that stigma in our community? And, you know, for someone who's dealing with those issues, how do you go about uh, handling that? Definitely. You know, for a lot of people, when you see someone with an injury, a cut, a broken arm or something like that, you can see the ailment. You can see the symptoms. Um, if someone has a fever, you can, you know, there's like that very physical, very obvious signs that there is that there is something that needs to be fixed, uh, not fixed, something needs to be healed. And so when it comes to, but when it comes to like emotional scars, people don't always see it. And oftentimes what is causing emotional trauma for one person may not necessarily be so evident and clear for somebody else. And so it's very hard for us to look at someone who might be experiencing emotional pain or emotional trauma and say, oh, I understand what they're going through. Because often we don't see the symptoms. They're not always so obvious. And sometimes when things aren't so obvious physically, when they don't have a physical manifestation, like say a fever or a broken bone or a cut or something like that, then we, we, we want to say, well, you know, you're just going through a phase or just get over it. Um, I've heard people say that before. I want to just get over it. Why do you feel bad? Those are really horrible things to say. You wouldn't tell someone who's got a physical injury, hey, just get over it, walk it off. Like That's like the worst thing you can tell somebody, right? When it comes to our emotional injuries, like those things are very real and people feel them. But what I'm feeling, what somebody else is feeling may not necessarily be the same. So it really requires us to have a great deal of empathy for one another and to say, you know what, if someone is having distress, if someone is feeling that emotional pain, I need, I don't need to belittle them or make light of their suffering, but I need to have empathy for them and, and help them maybe find uh, healing. And so it's true. If someone, was, if someone came to us with a great injury, we would, of course, help them find healing. So the same thing is true if someone is having an emotional uh, pain, emotional injury, we'd, we'd, we would want to give them the same type of healing um, as well, the same level of, of healing and care uh, as well. And the great thing about uh, living in, I think, this country is that you can absolutely seek counseling and no one ever has to know. We have really, 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 really good laws and rules and practices about keeping things private. And so no one ever has to know that you're going to counseling. It's just no one will ever find out. No one will ever find out. Just go. You know what I mean? So if you need help, go seek the help. But I'd say it's, it's always good to keep your achan in the loop. It's always good to keep your spiritual father in the loop. Um, because we want to make sure that there's also the element of, of spiritual guidance. And that being said, one of the other members of our uh, of the counseling department, uh, her name is uh, Susan Zachariah, and she's also from the Chicago area. And she's um, involved in a, uh, an organization called OCamper. It is a coalition of medical professionals, psychologists, counselors, uh, who, who work to find, uh, to gather resources and put things together to help specifically in the Orthodox context. The acronym is escaping me right now, but I think it's a, it's a uh, organization, counselors, uh, medical, psychology, and religion. It basically encompasses uh, counseling, uh, medicine, psychology, and of course, religion. So you have, you have all of these folks who are you know, specifically Orthodox, and the group actually has many folks who are both Eastern Orthodox as well as um, Oriental Orthodox, come from different different jurisdictions, but all that stuff, they kind of put things together. And one of the projects that they're working on is to really find, let's say, for example, an Orthodox therapist, someone who can maybe help you, give you counseling, give you treatment, but specifically knowing that what the knowing what life in the Orthodox Church is like, so they can continue to help you in that sense. So like like it's 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 a great, it's a great group and there's a lot of resources that they're kind of putting together. 
Um, we're still, you know, we're still working with uh, with them. And Susan Lute was very active with them. And yeah, it's it's uh, the Orthodox Christian Association of Medicine, Psychology, and Religion. That's what I, that's what I got in my head. There you go. So we have we have the the full acronym there. So we do have resources like that. And we're going to try. They're putting together right now a directory of of service providers, a national directory of service providers right now. They're, you know, but, that, but that's a work in progress. So let's say if someone, you know, the goal is ideally if someone needs help in, a, in whatever area they're in, we can find someone who can help them, or who's also probably most probably a practicing Orthodox Christian to understand what life in the church is like, as well as giving them that emotional, you know, support they need. I'm glad you brought that up here as we wrap it up, Ajin. You know, a lot of times if we want to especially go through the church to seek this type of help, uh, we may not know what type of resources are out there. Just so for the listeners, Ajin, is there anything else even in the future plan resource-wise from our church or even from our diocese? And even like, as you said, you're part of the Department of Counseling. Uh, can you just briefly talk about what resources um, that the diocese is trying to offer in that regard? Yeah, absolutely. So the Department of Counseling right now is, you know, it's just it's just a few of us, you know, that we're working very hard and trying to put resource together. So we're so we're a very small department. So like if someone needed, you know, counseling services or anything like that, and they they would call us, it's not anything that we would directly be able to provide. But what our job is to try to do is to empower the local priest or to give some sort of help, like example, like for example, with this directory of service providers that Ocamper is putting together to be able to, to, to direct them towards someone maybe in their local area who might be able to give them assistance on that level. But at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to, and we want to encourage our folks to have a good relationship with their priest, their local priest. Having the one-off confession once a year or once every couple of years at the random conference that you go to, to the one priest you might see that one time and never talk to ever again. It ha- it, I, I understand why many of us do that. And it has its uses, as you know, but the the greatest healing comes from having that consistent relationship with a spiritual father who can continue to hold us accountable. So if someone comes to me and confesses a, a, a sin to me, and I know that's something that they're struggling with, I can then go and check in with them periodically and say, hey, remember the thing that we talked about that one time? How are you dealing with that now? How's it going? Are you still having trouble with it? all these things to, to keeping the person continually accountable, to, to check in with them periodically, that's important. Every priest wants nothing but the best for his parishioners, wants them to, to have that relationship with God, uh, to seek repentance, to grow in their faith, to grow in their spirituality. And so, at the you know, counseling department, we want to empower the priest to provide that experience to their parishioner. We're here to help out as much as we can, whatever resources we can. And we're in the right now. We're going to come up with a few a few online seminars, a few online panel discussions are going to come out in the coming weeks, dealing with you know some of the real hard topics that we need to discuss. We've talked about already, sort of talking about things like depression and suicide, alcoholism. We've talked about. We're planning for an upcoming seminar on something as serious as sexual abuse and sexual assault with the specific emphasis on things happening on college campuses. And so we want to give people information, give people awareness of issues and give people resources and direct them toward resources of what they can do uh, and where they can go if they need additional help. Yeah, that's a great thing to hear, Achin. And I think that's a good place for us to wrap up here. Um, Like we said in the beginning, these are very important topics that you know, we may not always address in the church setting, um, but these are lifelong struggles and issues that we have to go through. Uh, it never ends for us. So I really appreciate you, Etchin, taking time to talk about these issues with us today. Thanks for having me. And like I said, I'm, I'm, it was an honor for me to be able to join today, Ruben, to talk about all these things. And I, I, I would like to bring more awareness to these to these topics. And and I want to, you know, make people aware that there, there shouldn't be a stigma around anything related to emotional health, emotional well-being, just like there's no stigma related to physical well-being. So I, I treat it the same. And so I, I, my goal is to create awareness as much as possible so that people can go seek help wherever they need it, whether it's through confession or counseling or both, whatever people need. And I hope the, these ministries can definitely have a further impact and reach to get the people the help that they need it in their lives, even if they don't realize it. But thank you, Etchen, again. And for anyone who is in need of those resources, we will have them in the description of the video below. But I hope you all continue to stay safe out there 
and please stay tuned for another episode of Chaya Chats.